Okay, welcome everyone um, to our brand new webinar series with the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. My name is Matt Schumar. I am the program coordinator for OBCI. Um, joined with me today is Jen Moore and Selby Bean, um, who are co-chairs of the Outreach and Education Committee. So they're helping to organize this great webinar series that uh, we're really excited about. So if you are new uh, to the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, we are a network of organizations throughout the state of Ohio and regionally working together for bird conservation. We were established in 2004. And since that time, there are, have been around 120 organizations joined this network. So it's everyone from local um, metro parks and state parks up through state wildlife and federal uh, fish and wildlife agencies. We have museums, um, nature centers, nonprofits, a whole range of folks involved in this effort, um, working together on collaborative bird conservation efforts. So over the course of that, around 18 years almost, um, we've done a lot of conservation planning that has helped inform some of the regional migratory bird joint venture efforts, as well as um, the Ohio Division of Wildlife. And we work on programming for conservation professionals, as well as private citizens, um, landowners, bird enthusiasts, anybody who's interested um, in what we do or interested in birding. So if you are new to OBCI, you can visit our website at obcinet.org to learn about what we do. And there are lots of resources on there, how to make your homes and, and properties bird friendly um, and information on some of the conservation work that we do. The next webinar in this series is going to be by Madeline Sudnick, um, who was a student in Dr. Kelly Williams' lab at Ohio University. Um, she's now a graduate student researcher at the University of Arkansas. She'll be presenting Nature versus Nurture. Parental care does not mitigate consequences of poor environmental conditions in Eastern bluebirds. Um, I saw Maddie present uh, at least part of her research at a recent Ohio Bluebird Conference. Um, she is a wonderful presenter and I'm really excited about um, her presentation in March. Her research was at least partially funded by Columbus Audubon. Um, so if you're joining us and a member of Columbus Audubon, um, this is where some of, some of your dollars go. So we're really excited about her presentation. So be sure to check out our website and social media accounts and sign up for uh, that webinar, which will be on March 22nd at the same time. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, uh, which I know many of you are here and excited to see, um, Dr. Blake Mathis, Associate Professor at Ohio Dominican University. Um, I met Blake around nine years ago, I think, um, when we started, or when he and uh, my friend Laura Kearns, who's with the Ohio Division of Wildlife, started a bird club for Union County. Um, if you're in that area, the bird club is still going strong, so you can, um, catch up with us afterwards if you'd love to find out about the New County Bird Club. Um, and I've been out to his place a couple times uh, on some of his famous bird or owl walks um, and also to see some banding demonstrations. So Blake is gonna talk about a program that he created called the Central Ohio Owl Project to document um, some secretive owls that occur in Ohio at, at various times of year. So without further ado, I will stop my sharing and turn it over to Blake to start the presentation. All right, well, thank you, Matt. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm gonna start out and just talk a, a little bit about myself and then get into the, into the research. So um, starting out with my uh, background, I am originally from here in Ohio. Um, I got my undergrad degree at Ohio Northern and then I did my PhD uh, at Rutgers University. My PhD research was um, looking at birds that have been introduced to uh, um, oceanic islands like uh, Bermuda and Hawaii. And so that sort of research is a little tough to do here in central Ohio. And it was partially what has led then to me having to find a, a new research project, um, something a little more accessible than flying to Hawaii. Um, I also was fortunate to get a lot of experience uh, with various jobs as a field technician um, around North America, working with the um, endangered Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow and the Everglades and with elephant seals out in California. Um, I did an electrofishing internship 
uh, here in Ohio for the EPA. Um, I spent one fall counting migrating hawks in Washington State and also got a little bit of experience uh, being able to, to handle some of those raptors at their uh, banding station there. I've now been at Ohio Dominican since 2012. If you're not familiar with Ohio Dominican, um, we're a small private Catholic university in Columbus, very near the uh, airport in Columbus. And we're fortunate to have Alum Creek running right through campus, which means that I get to take my students out on field trips and we can just walk out the door and be out in the creek or catching birds in the, uh, the forest. And it provides a, a really useful outdoor laboratory. Um, it has been a, a great institution that's really allowed me to teach the classes I wanted to and, and get students outside and out into nature. So I, uh, I didn't start birding until I was in college. Um, in this picture, that's me with the red arrow pointing to me. And my friends had gotten me into birding. I'd actually kind of, I don't wanna use the word hate. I had greatly disliked birds for most of my life. But some of my friends as shown in the picture here had gotten me interested in birding. And I'll just mention um, one of them uh, is standing on the, to my, well, left, facing to the left here it was John Kinsley, who's actually been involved in this, this owl research. So my junior year of college, I started looking into, into birds, started getting interested in birds. And one of the places that we would often go to look for birds is Kildeer Plains. Um, I'm sure if, uh, those of you who have been around Ohio birds for a while are familiar with Kildeer Plains. Um, a wonderful location, lots of wonderful birds. And one of the things when I was in college was that there were a lot of owls spending their time at Kildeer Plains, spending the winter, and were relatively easy to find, including long-eared owls and saw-wet owls. Um, I had, didn't know anything about birds at this point, so I was just going out and we would look at birds and pretty much every time we'd go to Kildeer Plains, we would get to see these wintering owls. And I just thought it was kind of normal and you know that long-eared owls were easy to find. I didn't realize how uh, unique of a situation it was and how it might not be representative of what those, uh, those owls are actually like uh, for most of the state or, or most of the time. Um, of course, as I got more and more interested in birds, I started traveling. I started doing my PhD research uh, various places. And one of the groups of birds I would always be looking for would be owls. And so I was uh, fortunate to travel these various places and see a variety of different types of owls. And once I then moved back to Ohio, one of the first things that I did was institute these owl walks where I would invite people from my university and people from the local bird club to come out to my house and we would wander around in the dark and try to see owls. And we were uh, fortunately successful that every one of the owl walks that I've led, we've seen at least one owl. Some have been more successful than others, but we've been able to find owls. Um, before the walk, we would have a meal, people would bring food. And so it was a good time uh, to get together, eat some food, and then wander aimlessly in the dark and, and hopefully find some owls. That interest in owls is, I think, one of the things that has then inspired this research um, as I already kind of had this history and was at least known around Ohio Dominican as, as the, uh, the person who did work with owls because of those owl walks. All right, so I wanna take a step back for a second and we'll look at the, the kind of the bigger picture here. Um, one of the job of a biologist is to, to survey species, to try to figure out what organisms are around um, and how many individuals might be be present in a population. And for many wildlife species, this is relatively easy. Um, many types of wildlife are, you know, pretty straightforward. You can drive around and see them. Um, for those of you who have bird feeders, it's uh, uh, not a difficult to sit and watch out the window and count the number of individuals that come to the bird feeder. And for those species that are relatively obvious and relatively easy to find, there's a lot of different survey options, a lot of different possibilities um, for how we could potentially count those, the individuals and those populations, figure out if they're there and how many of them are present. Recently, um, citizen science has become uh, one of the main ways that people look, uh, gather data on those different groups of organisms, that the number of biologists in the world is relatively small. 
but the number of people in the general public who have the ability to see, recognize, and submit reports is relatively large. And so by harnessing those people from the general public who want to participate, we can gather a lot more information about species, whether they are common species, rare species, anything can be sampled with citizen science. For birds, this primarily happens through eBird. There are a couple of other places where bird information ends up, but eBird is one of the main, main avenues of citizen scientists um, submitting their, their bird observations. And so if you go to the eBird webpage, it's this opportunity to not only submit your own information, but also to look at information that other people have submitted. It's basically this giant database containing millions and millions and millions of observations of birds. And so if, for example, you go to eBird and let's say you're interested in American robins. And so here in the middle of the screen, we have Ohio Dominican University um, and we might be interested in, well, have there been any American robins seen in the area? And we can see each of these little colorful dots represents um, places where American robins have been seen. And then if we, if we click on them, we can see who has reported those robins, how many, um, when those were reported. It gives a really good way to, to visualize and access those, those data about when those birds were found and where they were found. And for robins, we can see that there are, well, reports all over the place. Those data can then be put into this giant database where we can figure out things like the time of year that they're most abundant, so these uh, bar charts can be generated based on those data. You can also do things like line graphs. So this is data for the state of Ohio. And we see that in some weeks, there may be you know, over 200,000 American robins being reported um, in the state of Ohio. Lots of good information that gets um, put into this giant database, which becomes easily accessible. Well, of course, since I was interested in owls, I would occasionally go to eBird and say, okay, I wonder what owls have been seen near me. And for example, this is uh, the data for um, long-eared owls. Now, if we start looking here, we see that there are just a couple of data points. And if we look at those specific data points for long-eared owls in this area, well, we can find that, well, I, I was the one who submitted this sighting of a long-eared owl. And then I was the one who submitted this sighting of a long-eared owl. That we had an owl that spent um, four days at our farm in Union County uh, back in 2017. And for this area, those are the, the only two reports of long-eared owls. So this is what kind of inspired my research. I, I thought there's no way that I'm the only one who's seen long-eared owls in this area. Um, and there's no way that these are the only long-eared owls that have been in this area that Maybe we're maybe we're missing some. Maybe this isn't actually representative of the true number and diversity of long-eared owls that would be found in that area. And so I got to thinking about how do we survey species that are not easy to find and observe, species that are rare or that hide really well. And it's true that owls are very hard to find. They tend to choose habitats that hide them well, their plumage is camouflaged, mostly active at night, and especially for um, our rarest owl species, they're quiet during their time here in Ohio. So for some owl species, things like screech owls and great horned owls, they can be relatively easy to hear. For other owl species, it might be pretty difficult to find them. Um, the picture I have here on the right is the long-eared owl, uh, perched in a the tree that our house where it spent four days in 2017. Um, I was lucky that I noticed it, but it would be really easy to miss it. Now, even if owls are seen, sometimes owls don't get reported. And there's a couple of reasons for this. And one of the reasons is that owls are sensitive to disturbance. Um, when rare or exciting birds show up, often large groups of people are interested in seeing those rare birds. Um, this is just a picture that I uh, borrowed from the internet, but this is an example of, uh, I think this was in the UK, uh, of a rare bird was sighted and you know many, 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 many people showed up in an attempt to see it. Well, this is especially true for owls. Owls are large and charismatic species. 
this uh, picture on the left here is from a, a video that was taken a few years ago of, uh, I think it was out on the West Coast, and someone was wandering around out where there were multiple snowy owls trying to hunt, and they were walking right up next to the owls and trying to take pictures and so forth, um, and potentially disturbing the owls, interrupting their feeding, and you know maybe causing problems for those owls. Um, and it, there was an extreme example of this back in 2016, where there was a northern hawk owl seen out in Washington state. Um, a lot of birders went out to see that northern hawk owl. The landowner where the northern hawk owl was located got sick of the, the birders um, driving by and stopping on the public road and looking at the owl and photographing the owl and eventually shot the owl and, and killed it. And so because of all of these issues associated with owls, often, people who know about owls and know where owls are don't actually report those owls. There's also often a, a general lack of awareness that even if somebody sees a rare owl, they may not realize it's a rare owl or realize that maybe somebody like me would be interested in knowing about that owl. So just because somebody sees it doesn't mean that we're gonna hear about it. All right. so. If we're missing some of these owls being present, well, how could we find them? What could we do to actually document that they're there? And so that got me to thinking about how we look for and document rare animals. One way that has become, especially over the last couple of decades, especially successful is automatic cameras. We can put these cameras out, they can survey the area 24 hours a day, seven days a week, take these great pictures, um, there have been some really good discoveries that have come out from having these high quality automatic cameras surveying areas for much longer than a, a person could ever do. Uh, we also sometimes will do trapping. Um, the, for example, this is a, a mouse that I caught from my mammalogy class. We put out live traps. Even though I walk around on campus quite often, I don't normally see these mice in the woods, but when you put out traps, then you can catch them and know that they're there. Similar sort of story with tracks. Tracks can be used to indicate the presence of organisms that we might not otherwise see. If you ever walk around down near a creek, you know that you see lots and lots of raccoon tracks, even though you might not see any actual raccoons. Again, those sorts of uh, track finds have led to discoveries. Uh, this article, for example, talking about the striped hyena being rediscovered in Armenia, and part of the evidence was from, from tracks being found. And then finally, for some rare species, we'll use dogs. Um, dogs, especially because of their sense of smell, are really good at finding organisms that we as humans are not. And so if you're somebody studying, let's say, mountain lions, you're probably going to use dogs to, to track them, because otherwise it'd be very, very difficult to find them. So I took these ideas about how to find rare species, and I realized, well, none of these are great for owls. That some of them might work some of the time, but as far as a comprehensive survey for these species, it's just not going to be successful because, for one thing, owls fly around, which makes it harder to predict where they might be, where we have the dogs um, out, where the owls might have landed. It's very unlikely we'd be successful with those sorts of approaches. So that led me to starting the Central Ohio Owl Project. My hope being to better document location and abundance of owls wintering in, in central Ohio. I chose central Ohio because um, I'm from central Ohio and it also seems like perhaps there's not as much uh, birding effort in some parts of central Ohio. I needed to pick which species to focus upon. Here in Ohio, we have eight uh, owl species that occur every year. Of those eight, Screech owls, great horned owls, and barred owls are relatively common. Um, they're pretty widespread throughout the state, and they're relatively easily found. So I thought we probably had a pretty good idea about those species. Uh, a couple more, snowy owls and short-eared owls tend to be here primarily in the winter, um, but also happen to be active during the daylight. For short-eared owls, this is especially at dawn and dusk, making it much easier to find them because they're actually out in the open. We can see them um, and document them in that way. Well, that then led me to our last three species of regularly occurring owls here in Ohio, long-eared, saw-wet, and barn owls. And these species 
are harder to find, are more difficult to survey because of their almost strictly nocturnal behaviors and the fact that they are relatively quiet when they're here in the state of Ohio and because they're relatively rare. So I thought I would focus on these three species. I'll just do a quick uh, introduction to these three species and then talk about um, how the project progressed. So sawwood owls, this is the smallest owl we have here in Ohio. They may occasionally breed, but if they do, it's very rare. They really like to eat mice, especially paramiscus mice, like deer mice and white-footed mice. And they spend their winter often in thick vegetation. Um, we're often found in evergreens, but may also use things like grapevine tangles, anything that's really thick and tends to hide them very well. They're considered a species of special interest in Ohio, um, which basically means we're kind of on the edge of the breeding range. There's not a large population. Um, and there may not be much we could do to really increase the population here in Ohio. Long-eared owls uh, are found throughout the Northern Hemisphere. And again, similar to the sawwet, may breed occasionally here in Ohio. Um, Long-eared owls use old nests from hawks and crows. They eat a variety of small mammals and also uh, will eat some other things, but small mammals are their main prey and spend most of their winter roosting in evergreen trees and are also a species of special interest. My third species then is the barn owl. Barn owls are found basically worldwide. They're in Ohio as a rare breeder. There's uh, a few hundred individuals that will breed in Ohio. The uh, installation of nest boxes from the Division of Wildlife and from private um, landowners has greatly increased the number of barn owls in Ohio, but we're still kind of at the northern edge of their range. As their name implies, they like to spend their time in buildings, um, but can also be found in evergreen trees. These are considered a threatened species here in Ohio. So for the owl project, I decided that there would be two main approaches to finding out about these owls in central Ohio. Targeted searches, and then I would solicit sightings. I'm going to talk about targeted searches first. What I've noticed, um, especially over the last uh, 10 years that I've been living in Ohio, is that there are a lot of places that I would drive by and I would think to myself, wow, that looks really good for owls. I wonder if anyone is checking to see if there's any owls in those trees. This is primarily patches of evergreen trees. And so what I started doing was keeping track of where I saw those thick stands of evergreen trees. And then, I mailed the uh, property owners a letter and asked, would it be okay if I went in and looked for owls um, on your property? It looks like you have good owl habitat. I'd be interested in um, coming out for a day and just walking around and seeing if I could find any owls that were there. So last winter, I spent a lot of my time out in these stands of evergreen trees, just kind of walking back and forth, seeing if I could find any owls. Um, I will also mention that uh, Mr. John Kinsley, I mentioned towards the beginning of my talk, spent a lot of time out there with me also, and we would just walk, especially since many of these um, evergreen trees are planted stands, they were planted in rows, so we'd walk back and forth in the rows, seeing if we could find owls. Um, one of the ways that we would look for owls is the presence of whitewash, right, the areas where the owls have been roosting and there gets to be these kind of piles of, of feces that build up on the branches. Um, these are often, if the owls have been using a roost for an extended period, are often really obvious. Uh, there are a lot of things that you might mistake for whitewash when you're looking for owls, like tree sap, for example. However, it's been my experience that whitewash is bright, bright white. It's very obviously white whereas the sap is often more of a gray. And then also you'll tend to find whitewash out onto the branches more, whereas sap often ends up, tends to be down along the side of the trunk. And so the picture on the right here would be an area where a long-eared owl had been roosting for an extended period. And it almost looks like you kind of took a paintbrush with a lot of paint on it and just kind of painted the side of the branch. That it's actually just kind of dripping down a lot of whitewash in that case. Of course, in addition to the whitewash, uh, we'd be looking for owl pellets. These, of course, are the, uh, the bones and the hair that the owls regurgitate um, from their prey, things that they can't digest. Um, I put together a, a little diagram here to show some of the 
uh, owl pellets from some of our owls in Ohio, give you some idea of the differences in sizes that can provide a little bit of a um, of guide to what kind of owl they might have come from. So for example, saw wet owls have obviously very small pellets, much smaller pellets than you might find in something like a long-eared owl or um, a great horned owl or barn owls, both have very large pellets. Um, I've made this uh, into a PDF. So if anybody's interested, um, I could um, email that to you or maybe I can upload it to the chat, uh, share that file here. Um, because the pellets are really a key way to know if the whitewash you found has come from an owl and then also how much that roost has been used and um, what kind of owl it's, it's likely to be. The other part of the project then was to solicit sightings, to ask people, if you've seen an owl, let me know. Ohio Dominican uh, put up a web page for me where anybody could go and submit their sightings. Um, so just ask a few basic questions just about the, who the person is, if it's okay to contact them, which county they were in, and then what sort of owl they, were, they had seen, if they knew. Um, and uh, these were entirely confidential reports. And so I wasn't going to share these so that they might have people, you know, unfortunately trespassing or looking for the owls without permission. They were used just for the, the research for the project. Um, Ohio Dominican also put together a graphic that could be shared on social media. I also reached out to various other forms of media. So for example, this is an article that was in a Ohio Cooperative Living Magazine. This goes out to um, everybody in Ohio that is a member of a, an electric cooperative. And so it has a, a distribution of, of hundreds of thousands. Um, Chip Gross was nice enough to write an article about the project. Um, and it provided that information about where to submit um, sightings if people had them. And then I also talked to various local newspapers. Um, the Columbus Dispatch did an article, Jim McCormick wrote that, it was very helpful. Uh, I was also interviewed on a few different um, radio programs about the project to try to get the word out that if you've seen an owl, I wanna hear about it. All right, so let's get to results. Lots of people submitted reports of owls that they'd seen. Over 1,600 reports were submitted. Many of those reports came with photographs. Um, it might not surprise you to learn that barred owls were easily the most photographed owl in Ohio. So lots of barred owl reports, um, lots of pictures of barred owls. These are all pictures that were submitted to the, to the project. Um, Eastern screech owls, again, a relatively uh, commonly reported owl and I tended to find that Eastern screech owls were the most likely owl to end up inside people's houses, garages, um, barns, were often Eastern screech owls. I also got, of course, some of the target species that I was really focusing on. So people with saw wet owls, um, for example, sitting out just on their, their deck on a chair, uh, not exactly where you normally expect to find a saw wet owl. The picture on the far left was a saw wet owl that was one of the first reports I got. Um, this person went out and uh, sitting down next to their tire of their car that was in the driveway was a saw wet owl that flew over into these, these low shrubs. Um, this person is not familiar with saw wet owls that it had to be a, a, you know, a tiny baby because it was so small. But in fact, it was a migrating saw wet owl that had stopped for the day by the tire of her car and then found these, these shrubs to, uh, to spend its time. Um, similar sorts of stories with long-eared owls. For example, the picture on the right, which is one of the best pictures of a long-eared owl I've ever seen. These people were just out walking their dog and the dog actually pointed out the long-eared owl to them. It was perched on this exposed branch. They took a picture, they saw it in the morning when they walked their dog, and then they came back in the evening, were walking their dog and, and the owl was still there and then gone the next day. Um, Certainly a sighting of a longer owl that never would have been heard about if it wasn't for the owl project. Some of the most um, exciting and surprising longer owl reports were a couple of uh, homeowners that contacted me about long eared owls that they had that were roosting just outside their windows. So these were literally in um, Norway spruce trees that were just outside of bedroom windows. So you could stand inside the house and look out and see multiple long-eared owls just a few feet away. 
In fact, the picture on the left is a picture that I took from inside a bedroom through the window of a long-eared owl sitting there. Um, these owls spent the winter at these two locations. There were three owls at one location and four owls at the other location. One was in Union County, one was in Allen County. Um, and it was just, I never thought I would be standing in some, inside someone's house looking at long-eared owls that you could almost just reach out and touch. I also got barn owl reports. Um, I, I didn't get as many barn owl reports from central Ohio as I had thought I would. So there were some barn owl reports, but they were more limited. Um, and I guess indicated to me that perhaps there's not as many barn owls in central Ohio, in central Ohio as I thought there might be. All right, so of those 1,600-ish reports that were submitted, um, John Kinsley and I went through and looked at each report, looked at the information that was submitted about the description, the picture if it was present, and were able to, for 844 of those reports, with relative confidence, identify which species had been seen. Um, this table shows those numbers. So uh, unsurprisingly, barred, barred owl, great horned, and screech owls were the most uh, numerous reports. But also then, saw wets, long-eared, and barn owls were, were all reported. Um, this is statewide, so this is not just for the central Ohio area, but these are statewide reports. I was also somewhat surprised, especially the first time it happened, that there were multiple hawks reported to the owl project. I really thought that owls were, um, were unmistakable, but it turns out that especially red-shouldered hawks are regularly reported as being owls. And so the first time it happened, I was pretty shocked, but then it kept happening and I got used to it, but it's, it still surprises me that people would see, um, see hawks and think that they were owls. So that was definitely something that I, I learned from this, this project. And for some reason, perhaps because red-shouldered hawks often tend to be close to people's houses, um, tend to be kind of a suburban hawk often, those were the ones that were most often they reported. All right, so let's talk about the results of the searches. So uh, we went out and searched multiple locations over five different counties. And those counties were Union, Logan, Delaware, Champaign, and Franklin. Our first day of searching, John Kinsley and I went out um, on December 28th, uh, 2020, and we went to a location in Union County, a private location, and found three sawwood owls in that first place that we looked. So that was a, a great start to the project. Um, it, we didn't, we weren't that successful every time, but for that first time, that was very successful. Uh, overall, we were able to find six different sawwood owls, um, one barn owl, and, and three long-eared owls. So part of my project then was to compare this information to um, eBird to think about how, how eBird, what kind of a job eBird is doing at documenting these rare species. So if we take a look at eBird and look at all of the eBird reports for these three species, and I'm gonna use Union County as my example here. Prior to 2020, you can see that there had been no sawwood owls reported, only two barn owls and three long-eared owls. However, during a single winter of searching and our reports to the project, we were able to find three sawwets, um, one barn owl, and five long ears. So we were able to find in a single winter of taking reports and searching for owls, more of the longer owls and sawwet owls than had ever been reported to eBird for the, the history of, of the database. So my hope is then with this research, it's going to help to give us um, a more accurate understanding of the actual abundance of these owls um, here in central Ohio. And to sort of provide a critique of whether eBird is doing a good job of keeping track of the, these owl populations. Finally, there's the possibility since um, these species all do at least occasionally breed in Ohio, possibly doing things like putting up nest boxes, or in the case of long-eared owls, putting up wicker baskets in areas where long-eared owls are spending the winter to encourage them to stay and spend the summer in Ohio and breed here. Um, the long-eared owls that stayed outside the house in Allen County were here in Ohio until the end of April, um, which is past when their breeding season is supposed to start. So there might be that possibility of encouraging them to stay here in Ohio and breed. 
Um, in addition to the, the observational part of the, the research, I also started banding sawwet owls during migration. So in this process, um, nets are set up that um, are very fine mesh. The uh, audio is played of a, of a sawwet owl that attracts them to the area of the nets while they're migrating. Um, and then as they're looking for the source of that vocalization, they end up flying into a net and, and getting caught. Each owl that is captured then gets weighed and measured and banded. The bands are these um, small aluminum rings that go around their legs, have a unique number on them, allowing us then to uh, keep track of if that owl is ever seen again, that we would know where it was banded and where it came from. Of course, all this information gets submitted to this uh, federal bird banding laboratory with this large database of, of millions of, of bands um, that can then be accessed when you find a bird with a band. Um, so the sawwet owl banding, I'm not the only one who bans sawwet owls uh, here in Ohio, uh, but most of, the, most of these tend to be um, kind of around the edges of the state. So I'm in Union County, represented in blue there. So um, I'm kind of the only one that's in central Ohio trying to capture these owls during migration. Um, this will give you an idea of how many I captured. So fall of 2020, I caught 15 and banded them. I tried in spring and I got one, but just one. And it was in early March. And then this last fall, I was able to ban 14 sawwet owls. Now, when I put a band on them, that provides the possibility then of maybe getting some information about those owls later on. So look at a couple of examples of that. Um, here's an owl that I banded on November 9th, 2020. Uh, the following March, this was unfortunately hit and killed by a car up in Ontario. So had probably either spent the winter in Ohio or traveled farther south, but then was on its way back north on March 18th, and unfortunately was hit and killed. But the person um, who found it uh, submitted the data to the bird banding laboratory, and that provides good information about that owl and where it was going. Um, less sad of a story, this owl I banded on November 8th, and it was recaptured again down in um, southwestern Ohio on November 23rd. So that's a period of 15 days and it had traveled 68 miles, an average of about four and a half miles per day as it continued its, its migration to the south. Surprisingly, that same owl was recaptured by the same people at the same banding station on December 8th, this last winter. So over a year later, it was apparently migrating in a about the same um, direction, same location, and was captured again. Now, in addition to the owls that I banded being um, recaptured, it's also possible for me to capture owls that have been banded by someone else. So this owl was banded on September 14th of 2020 up in Ontario, and I caught it uh, on October 24th of 2020, so 40 days later, it had traveled about 530 miles, an average of a little over 13 miles per day during its fall migration. Uh, this last fall, I was able to capture an owl that had originally been banded on November 4th of this last fall. I caught it on November 23rd. Over the course of those 19 days, it had traveled 93 miles. This is actually a bird that was banded up on Kelly's Island by Tom Bartlett. Um, who has, um, I've been working with some for some of this owl research and is a pretty well-known bird bander here in Ohio. He's now banded over 100,000 individual birds and over 1,000 owls. And I happened to get one of his owls as it was making its way farther south. And then I also had a second recapture of an owl that was originally banded up in Quebec on September 27th. I caught it. Um, 54 days later, on November 20th, it had traveled 870 miles. And so it had traveled a little over, on average, 16 miles per day during its migration. So this sort of information is just absolutely invaluable to be able to see where these owls are going, where they're coming from, how long it's taking them to travel. And then from year to year, 
what sort of uh, pathways they're taking. Um, when we catch sawwet owls, it's possible to determine their age by the use of a, of a black light. They have a pigment called porphyrin in their feathers, and this porphyrin pigment glows pink under a black light. And so the picture on the left there shows the underwing of a sawwet owl. This bird was a hatch year bird. That is to say, it had been hatched the same year that it was caught. And so these were all relatively new feathers. The porphyrins were all in relatively good shape. They tend to degrade pretty quickly. And so if you catch an owl that's older, you can end up then with a mixture of older feathers and newer feathers. The brighter pink feathers are the newest. And then in this case, we've got some that are a little more faded pink and then some that aren't pink at all. Uh, that indicates we have multiple ages of, of feathers here. And so this bird we would say is after second year. So um, it's at least three years old and, uh, and maybe more. Now, when trying to catch the sawwet owls, I incidentally will sometimes catch other owls. So Eastern screech owls occasionally get caught. These are non-migratory owls that occasionally end up in my nets. So these are the four that I've caught and banded so far. Um, I wanna especially point out this one because look how fluffy and adorable that thing is. It was the first red morph screech owl that I'd caught. Um, and I know we're not supposed to anthropomorphize or get too sentimental, but it, it looks just like a, a stuffed animal. Now, additionally, I've been trying to catch and band long-eared owls um, to try to figure out if they are using the same wintering locations from year to year. So um, last winter, I was able to catch and ban three of them from a single roost in uh, Union County. Um, and these were the first long-eared owls I'd caught. It was uh, pretty exciting and quite an experience. Um, unfortunately, one of those long-eared owls that I had caught on March 21st um, in Union County was found dead in Cleveland on December 10th. So it had apparently uh, traveled back north for the summer and was probably on its way south again, um, but unfortunately did not survive to make it, maybe, maybe going back to where it had been before, we don't know but had not, had not survived. So good information, um, but unfortunate that it was through a, a dead owl. Um, I've also, I had some of the pictures before, I've been collecting owl pellets for my research. Um, this can help with learning things about the diet of the owl by dissecting the pellets. We can see what kind of things that they've been eating. Um, I'm also gonna be collaborating with somebody here at Ohio Dominicone on, on looking at environmental DNA. So see if we can use DNA to get a more complete view of what the owls have been eating. And then also environmental DNA may allow us to figure out which species of owl a pellet came from if it wasn't found, um, well, directly under an owl that we can just look at and know, know which species it was. Um, and so that's some, some research that I'm really excited about to, to try to learn more about what these owls are actually doing ecologically, um, what they're eating mostly small mammals, but there's a variety of other things that end up in those pellets um, that are really, uh, really interesting. And perhaps there's even more of a story that the environmental DNA will help to reveal. Uh, all right, so I have to mention a few acknowledgements quickly. Columbus Audubon provided funding for the Central Ohio project. So that was uh, very helpful, um, allowed me to spend a lot of time and, and effort out trying to catch and find owls um, Ohio Dominican Marketing Public Relations put together the website, put together the graphics that I used. Um, I'll mention Aiden Van Fossen, who I think is actually here watching this talk. Um, he has contributed um, owl pellets that he's found out in the field. So that was very helpful. And then of course, I have to thank the, the landowners and the public that have reported their owl sightings and allowed me to come out and try to find owls on their property. Um, without that, they wouldn't be able to, to have, a, have a project. I also uh, would like to thank my, my family. Uh, my wife and daughters have had to <laughs> occasionally put up with a lot with me being um, up late trying to catch owls. And um, my daughter's bedroom is on the same end of the house where I have the, uh, the uh, recorder playing that plays the saw wet owl sound. And so they get to hear that for an extended period of time um, as they're trying to go to sleep during, uh, especially during fall migration. So. Um, they've all been very supportive the vast majority of the time, <laughs> and I'm appreciative of that. Okay, um, with that, 
I guess I will take any questions and uh, comments that people might have. Yeah, Blake, if you want to stop sharing, I'll go ahead and uh, switch to gallery here and we can, we got a bunch of questions in the Q&A. So I will um, send those to you. If folks have questions, just a reminder, use the Q&A. Uh, I'll go through those and, and ask Blake. So the first question on there, uh, anonymous, what was the purpose of the cash reward incentive? So did you have a feeling that that, that was necessary to really solicit the data? So I, I instituted the cash reward to try to get more reports, um, but nobody ever took me up on it. I offered the cash reward to a few people, um, but I don't think it really increased the number of reports that I got. Okay, great. So James uh, has a couple questions. His first is that he had a difficult time this year finding long-eared owls where he found many last year. Um, this is kind of similar to the discussion we had before we got started today. Do you think this is just a bad year or what's going on with some of those boreal breeders that you think might, might be resulting in differences? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I also have not found long-eared owls in the places that I found them last winter. Um, I've had a few reports. I know that there are a few around, but uh, there don't seem to be as, as many uh, low of long-eared owls or sawwood owls. So I'll be interested to see. Now we do know from that banding return that at least one of the ones that was here last winter made it back into Ohio, um, but whether they're out there and we just haven't found them or whether the Nosmini came down, I'm not sure. Good question. Mm -hmm. Donna Perry asks, can people report owls from just whitewash or pellets if they're unable to see the owl? Are you interested in any of that information? Yeah, I would definitely be interested in that, um, especially if it's an obvious owl, like a sawwood owl pellets tend to be pretty small, tend to be pretty, pretty obvious. So. Yeah, I would, I, would take, I would take any owl reports, no matter what kind they are. All right, the, uh, the second question from James, which may actually be from Corey, I see his comment in the chat. Um, any tips for planting Norway spruce habitat for long-eared owls? Have you seen spacing of mature trees that seem to result in more detections? So I would say that the two groups that were just outside of people's houses were just single trees or just two or three trees together. Um, but they were very close to the house and they were very thick trees. So I, I really think it's just, it tended to be the larger Norway spruce. Um, I would think that single rows would not be as successful as clumps. Often when I find owls, they are kind of in the interior trees. Great, good to know. Um, Elena asks, if you've looked at owl data in iNaturalist or any thoughts about implementing something in the iNaturalist program? Um, I did. I have looked at iNaturalist and I did not find any additional reports that I was not aware of for these species. It didn't seem like people were using iNaturalist as much for these owls as they were using eBird. But I'd definitely be, I mean, I would certainly be open to, to trying to get more reports from it. Yeah, that, that's been my experience with just bird observations in general, um, mm -hmm. simply for the way that iNaturalists wants you to document observations. They, they really require that photographic evidence. And sometimes that's not always easy to do uh, with birds, but it may, may be pretty appropriate for, for your project here. So Erin Hazelton asks a really good question. Um, she wants to know if owls cross Lake Erie directly when they're migrating or if they do more of a, uh, they circumvent and do a shoreline um, movement. Yeah, that's a good question. Apparently they do, they will cross open water like Great Lakes. Um, there have been, unfortunately, some of the reports of a bunch of dead owls washing up after a storm goes through during migration or owls landing on boats. So I am sure that some of them go around and some of them cross, but I, I, I'm not, I don't think we know how many of which way, if they have any preferences. Laura Fay asks, can you talk about what kind of food um, people might be able to offer from a bird feeding perspective, other than putting small mammals out and creating yeah. rat traps? So, yeah, so probably the, the best way to support owls is the habitat, is encouraging grassland areas that are gonna support things like meadow voles especially. Um, that's, that's the habitat is the key. So leaving areas not mowed, um, not develop, that's where they're gonna be, the food that they need. Yeah. 
Manon wants to know, is there anything at all that we can do to help support your project? What else do you need? Um, the biggest thing I need for support is just if people let me know about owls. Um, all, any owl report I get is helpful. So whenever you hear an owl, see an owl, um, especially the rare owls, I I'm always wanted to hear about that. Um, any publicity is, is good for the project. We have a, a couple related questions here next related to playback, um, call and respond. So, so one, are you interested in those? And people also wanna know if they do those, one, should they? Two, if they are using playback, is there a sequence? What species should they be playing? Is there a particular order? Yeah, so I, I definitely will accept reports of owl calls. Um, using playback is something that is you know, a little controversial. Um, depends on what time of year it is, what kind of owl it is. We don't wanna be disturbing the owls or interrupting their breeding season. Um, if you do playback, uh, I recommend doing it sparingly. Most of these owls are very, very responsive to playback. So you don't necessarily need to play a lot to get a, an owl response. Um, and so uh, the general wisdom I've always heard is start with smaller owls and move up to larger owls because um, you don't want to scare away the smaller owls with the larger owls sound because the larger owls will definitely eat yeah. the smaller owls. Yeah. Yeah. I've known of owl banding stations that have had to close because they've released screech owls or saw wets and down comes a great horned owl and just picks it right up. <laughs> um, yeah. So that can be a real problem sometimes. Um, so, so Barbara, um, kind of a big question, but let's see how well you can summarize this succinctly. What is environmental DNA? So environmental DNA is just DNA that we get not from a biological sample, but just from the environment. So you take some water or some soil or maybe an owl pellet and you see what DNA is in there um, that may, that sort of leftovers that are kind of everywhere in the environment. Um, so for those owl pellets um, reports, do you want emails of those with photos? How would you like those received? Yeah, I would, I'm actually currently lacking any short-eared owl pellets. So certainly some, uh, uh, so at least some pictures of those would be very helpful so I can add those to the comparison. Okay. Derek Hill wants to know, why do you think there was not a larger number of barn owls in central Ohio? Central Ohio has a lot of agricultural land and maybe not as much of the, the sort of grassland habitat that barn owls need. Um, barn owls apparently need at least 40 acres of grassland habitats, which could be things like hay fields and, and pastures, but 40 acres at minimum to really support barn owls. So I think that maybe we just have so much agriculture that we're not getting enough of those large grassy areas. Yeah, I think that's true for a lot of grassland species as well. While, while some adapt quite well to agriculture, others don't. Mm -hmm. um, we've certainly seen like upland sandpiper um, kind of disappear mm -hmm. um, from a lot of places because of of loss of grassland habitat. So Lawrence wants to know, what is the effect of climate change on these owls? Um, so that it probably varies by species. For the smaller owls, like, uh, like sawwet owls, they are not going to be, as, be able to punch through a thick snow cover, like you think about things like great gray owls are kind of famous for doing. And so when we get a lot of really thick snow, that might prevent them from being able to feed successfully. And so climate change that results in, well, if it results in more snow, it's gonna make it harder. If it results in warmer temperatures with more melting snow, it might make it easier for them to be here. So I could definitely see whatever effect it has on their ability to get food is going to be the effect um, that climate change has. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple more questions. So one is a follow-up to the playback. Um, will sounds chase owls away or um, will they still be around during the day if people go back that next day and check? Yeah, it, it, if you play the sounds um, sparingly, it probably won't affect them too much. Um, there is the possibility if you have an owl that's territorial, that's actually out singing, setting up its territory, and you play the sounds over and over again, you might cause that owl to give up on that territory and, and move away. With the sawwet owl banding, when I'm playing the sounds, I have never seen a sawwet owl on our property aside from in the net. So. It doesn't, they don't seem to be staying in that area. They just come down and get caught and then they leave. And one more, and then I have a question for you actually. Um, someone wants to know, they want to find saw wet owls um, to get some mm -hmm. photographs, but they don't want to utilize playback. 
Um, any suggestions uh, on a search strategy? Is it based on habitat or, or what might you offer as a suggestion there? Yeah, when, I, when I'm looking for saw wets, I'm usually trying to find relatively thick stands of evergreen trees. Um, and then it's just walking around looking for pellets. Um, most of the ones we found last winter didn't have much whitewash, maybe a little. They were the ones, most of the ones we found were perched relatively high. If they're lower down, the whitewash may be more obvious, but it was really the pellets that were the key. Um, look, if you find a few small pellets, then start searching that tree very carefully. Saw wets are known for being relatively unafraid of people. They're unlikely to move if there's one up in the tree above you. And so just search carefully with your binoculars, everything that potentially could hold an owl. And if you search enough of those places, especially if you have those pellets on the ground, then you'll find the saw wet. But it, it does, it's just a matter of time, time and effort. I also will mention that saw wets do tend to be, most of the ones I've seen are on edges of, uh, uh, if there's a group of evergreen trees, there may be or be more on the edge as opposed to being the, the very middle of the area. More popped up, um, we've got some time. Um, do short ear owls avoid locations with many great horned owls around? This person, Paul, is trying to understand why this winter there haven't been many short eared owls in the area that they've had for the last five or six years. That's a great question. And I definitely don't know the answer to it. I mean, I, I definitely know that short ears, you know, they prefer the really large open areas, whereas the great horns are probably gonna be at least near woods, if not in woods. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't think there'd be that much overlap between those two. Um, and I don't know why there wouldn't be any short ears this year, but maybe it's why the same reason they're not as many long ears or, or saw wets this year. Yeah. And a question I had, have you thought about, and, and maybe your focal geographic area answers this question to some extent and that it would be more difficult, but have you thought about any seasonal follow-up on these for any late wintering birds? Um, that you find during the winter that might stick around as, as breeders. That they're all rare breeders in the state. And I know for a lot of these rare boreal breeding birds, both the owls and the finches, in places like southeastern Ohio and northeastern Ohio, um, when they do occur really late in the season, um, they can stick around as breeders. So I, I've wondered if you've thought about any seasonal follow-up on some of these. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that was actually one of the things that I was interested in with the group of long years that was in Allen County, where they stayed until the end of April, is I was asking the people, have you heard them vocalizing at all? Has there been? Um, but as far as we can tell, they just waited to migrate until later. But those are certainly the sort of places that I'd be interested in, not only following up, but then potentially putting up things like wicker baskets to see if the owls might, if they had the opportunity, might stay. Yeah, and, and that's the species, at least for your study area here, that I would expect um, maybe most likely to, to hang around as breeders. So yeah. fingers crossed, let's keep looking late. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Atlas 3 is just around the corner. <laughs> maybe we can, we can get that one in your area. <laughs> um, I'll mention that I, I put the uh, a PDF of that owl pellet picture in the chat. So if anybody wants that, that's, uh, that's available there. We'll also make that PDF available on our website. Um, and if there are any other materials, Blake, that you'd like to share with folks, we're happy to share those as well um, on the website. So that'll be at obcinet.org. Um, if you visit today, um, it might look different in another day or so. Uh, we're actually right in the middle of a server swap. Um, so there will be some upgrades to the website in the next few days. So check back, it'll be easier to watch all these archived webinars on our website. Um, and we'll be sure to, to get this um, posted the recording and those documents um, sometime this week. So um, thanks, Blake. Um, that was a really great presentation. And, and thanks. Uh, very successful guinea pig, I think. We had great um, <laughs> attendance today. Um, and this went really well. So thanks, everyone, for showing up. Um, we had a little over 100 people um, watching live, which is, is fantastic. So I hope that you join us on March 22nd for our next presentation. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, feel free to email me. <laughs>